Good afternoon. I'm Peter Bergen. I run the International Security Program at the New America Foundation, and it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce my uh, colleague and friend, Mike Waltz, who has this wonderful new book out, Warrior Diplomat, The Green Beret's Battles from Washington to Afghanistan, which really uh, outlines uh, Mike's quite unusual career as both being somebody who's uh, creating policy in the White House. He was South Asia advisor to Vice President Cheney, and also then carrying out uh, the policies in the field as a special forces officer. Uh, Mike is also runs a successful business. He's a, he's a fellow here at the New America Foundation. And so he's gonna uh, outline uh, kind of the big ideas and, and some of the interesting stories in the book. And then we'll throw it open to a question and answer session with everyone here. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. So thank you, Peter. And thanks everyone for, for coming out today. Let me just take a, a brief moment and kind of talk about big to small, some of the broader strategic issues that I've tried to address in the book and that uh, really underline a lot of both my experiences, as Peter mentioned, in the White House, working for, Secretary, or for Vice President Cheney, over in the Pentagon, working for Secretary Gates and Rumsfeld, and then as a Reserve Special Forces officer uh, out in the field. So bear with me one moment. Let's take a little bit of a history lesson looking back on the war. And in looking back on it thus far, where I think we've made some critical mistakes that historians decades from now will look back on. Um, the first is that our strategy never really adjusted with the insurgency as it began growing past uh, 2001. So we had a very CT-focused strategy, a counterterrorism-focused strategy targeting Al-Qaeda and targeting key Taliban leaders. But as, that, as we kind of, that died down and as uh, the Afghan government stabilized, our strategy didn't necessarily coalesce and evolve with it. And what that drove um, unfortunately was a perennial under-resourcing of the war effort. So we found ourselves as violence began to grow in the kind of 2003, 2004, 2005 time frame, we found ourselves chasing the violence rather than putting the resources in necessary to get ahead of it. Uh, and there were some important reasons for that, one of which uh, most obviously was the Iraq War. Uh, you know, I was on the ground and saw the kind of sucking sound of resources, whether it was helicopters or predator drones or what have you, getting pulled away from, from the Afghan theater uh, over into Iraq. But where it really came into a play was once the insurgency had, had reconstituted and the Taliban had truly reconstituted about 2006, and I came back from, from my tour back to the Pentagon and said, hey boss, you know, this isn't going well and there was nothing to give. We were truly were, that was the, you know, kind of the nadir, the, the depths of the Iraq war, and there was nothing to, to, to commit. So we found ourselves more and more reliant on NATO to provide those resources that we didn't have at that point. And that's not a moral statement uh, on the Iraq war, it's just a, more a statement of fact from my perspective. No country can fight two wars as, as well as it fights one. So that's one. Um, the other kind of critical mistakes looking back is, which I just mentioned, is handing the effort over to NATO uh, and handing a mission over to NATO that it frankly wasn't prepared to do. NATO, I was both in the Pentagon and then out on the ground as we transitioned uh, the lead for security over to, over to NATO, which was the ISAF coalition. And they frankly thought they were getting into kind of a Bosnia-style peacekeeping mission. Uh, I was there on the ground in Helmand when the Brits came down. I was in Aruzgan when the, when the Dutch took over and over in Kandahar when the Canadians took. And they came prepared to do what they call kind of soft beret patrolling and engaging with the populace. And frankly, they, in 2006, they ran into a buzzsaw that their political constituencies weren't prepared to deal with. So they signed up to do peacekeeping and found themselves, by the time they deployed, in a full-blown counterinsurgency effort. So that was, uh, that was too, and I write to that quite a bit uh, in the book, and being on the ground from French special forces that you know, didn't have the equipment, didn't have compatible radios, sometimes didn't even have enough ammunition, to being with Dutch forces in Aruzgan um, and, and asking them to work with us, it had to go all the way up to their parliament for approval because of their national caveats. So it, it both instituted 
promulgated this kind of under-resourcing, but then it also um, really tied our hands in trying to fi fight an enormously complex war with a 42-nation coalition. So that's two. Three is we've never gotten our arms around Pakistan, not then or now, and the sanctuary that they afford. And you know, Seth Jones and others have done studies of counterinsurgencies over time, and none that they've found have been successful when the insurgent enjoys unfettered sanctuary uh, next door. And then four, and what I'd say is the probably the most critical, was announcing our withdrawal years in advance of that withdrawal. Uh, I was standing in my headquarters in 2009 when President Obama gave his speech at West Point announcing the surge, but then in the same speech announced the end of the surge and, and my operations officer standing next to me. So that's like, can you imagine Franklin Delano Roosevelt announcing D-Day, but then announcing to the Germans and to the world that it would only last six months to a year and kind of what the, the, the effect. So not a perfect analogy, but it was one that, one that he threw out. And it had immediate effects on the ground. Uh, two weeks later, I was up in the mountains in Host Province meeting with a Mangal tribe elder named Gaforzai and a gentleman that I had been building a relationship with for the better part of a year. Many, many cups of tea, many, many meetings, many hours of kind of getting to know each other, building that relationship and building a level of trust because, one, it was the largest tribe uh, in that part of Afghanistan. Two, they wanted to work with the Afghan government and against the Haqqani network, which was the, which was the predominant insurgent group in that area. And then three, he had about 1,500 tribal militia, which they call Arvakai, well-trained, well-armed, that I wanted working with us on this new program called, eventually called Village Stability Operations. Two weeks after the, um, the speech at West Point by President Obama, I go for this kind of final signing of a statement of commitment with, with uh, Gaforzai, and very cold reception, didn't offer tea. Uh, finally, after a few minutes, kind of got to the bottom of it, and he said, look, you know, we always suspected it, we've seen it in the past, but now your president has said it. You're going to abandon us, you're going to leave, and you're, you're, the, you know, the Haqqanis are gonna have a gun to my family's head uh, tomorrow night and as soon as you do. And I tried to kind of talk the nuance, no, he was only announcing the withdrawal of the surge, it's not all US, the nuance was lost. They heard that America was leaving, period. Um, and it had some truly detrimental effects in other ways as well. You know, we saw corruption actually spike after that announcement. It's kind of the get out, you know, get the money out while you can. We saw government officials that we had really been kind of gaining traction with reform efforts be less inclined to do so. Um, you know, we really, f frankly, were, were undermined by that policy statement within days within weeks of its announcement. It was a fascinating case of how a, you know, a, a, a policy kind of intended to go this direction immediately on the ground sent the tactical and operational um, effort uh, a totally different direction. So, you know, and, and this is how I ended the book, you know, the thing that Mulligan Forzai left me with was, you know, as we were leaving that, that meeting where he withdrew all of his support and pledged not only to, to not work with us, frankly told me they're going to be hedging their bets now with the Haqqani Network. He said, look, until you're prepared to have your grandchildren, not your children, but your grandchildren standing shoulder to shoulder with my grandchildren, we can't work with you and this will never work. And that's really a theme, that, that kind of commitment or lack thereof that, that runs uh, throughout the book. And the signal that that sent both to the region, to the Afghan government, uh, to the Afghan populace and to the enemy um, has, has really hurt us throughout the war effort. And it was rather, you know, whether you're only here for Al-Qaeda or now you're focused on Iraq or you're handing us off to NATO or you're announcing a surge to bring security but now you're announcing your withdrawal. And that theme runs throughout. So where does that leave us? Um, today I think we frankly have, to be very blunt, a policy of hope and, and a lot of assumptions. Um, right now we're assuming, uh, it was just 
discussed uh, today at the London conference, but we're assuming that the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police can stand on its own. I find it, uh, I find it difficult to wrap my mind around how the ANSF, the Afghan National Security Forces, are going to do alone without our support what 42 nations, 42 Western nations couldn't do in the, in the last 10 years. Um, and personally, I've been hearing that in Pentagon briefings and in the White House since about 2005, that the Afghan National Army would be able to stand and operate on its own in 2005, in 2007, no, now by 2009, then by 11, and now by 14. Um, the next assumption is that we're assuming this unity government will hold. Uh, as we all know, the Afghans haven't politically, peacefully transitioned in its entire history. We have a very tenuous situation uh, right now in the same year and at the same time that we're announcing a zero option. I think it's frankly uh, almost borderline irresponsible from a policy standpoint. We're also assuming that any types of reconciliation talks will progress in our interest. We're assuming that ethnic tensions won't continue to rise, and I think Washington grossly underestimates the amount of ethnic tension that's, that's on the ground right now. And then most importantly, we're assuming that Al-Qaeda can't and won't and isn't already reconstituting in the wake of our withdrawal. You know, I just did a, um, I just did a Q&A with Dana Perino of Fox News, and, and we kind of went through all of this, and she said, Mike, I got it. It's always the simplest questions that are hard. Uh, she said, why should the American people care? I mean, really, we've been at this for 10 years. We've invested billions of dollars. Uh, we've lost thousands of lives. That all is scary, but why, you know, why should they care? Well, I think we see now with ISIS in Iraq what can happen in the wake of our withdrawal and our precipitous withdrawal. And if that makes you nervous, you know, having ISIS on the doorsteps of Baghdad makes you nervous. Having a reconstituted al-Qaeda on the doorsteps of Islamabad with the keys to nuclear weapons should petrify you. It certainly does me. And I, you know, we can talk about the nuances of that analogy, and there's a lot, but I, but I think that there is uh, some real issue, and I have real issue, and I write to that in, in the book with just turning our back on the region. So what's the policy going forward? Uh, and, and how are we going to get uh, this what I think is aptly called long war to a better place. Well, a few years ago, I gave a talk to a bunch of new congressional staffers that were coming in in the wake of the 2012 midterm elections. And I talked about a country in Asia that at one point had a higher illiteracy rate than Afghanistan does today, had no roads, no infrastructure, no real political system, and certainly no army because it had been occupied for the better part of 50 years, and the country was South Korea. Uh, and it, it did indeed have a higher literacy rate in the 1940s than, than Afghanistan does today. And it's not a perfect analogy. There are many, many smart people in this room that could poke holes in it. But I do think it's a great example of what sustained U.S. engagement can do over the long haul. And I argue at the, at the end of the book, despite all of the mistakes that we've made and that we certainly need to learn from, that the sooner we stop attacking this in 18 months, three-year, four-year increments and start wrapping our minds around that this is going to be a generational, multi-decade effort, I think actually the sooner we'll be uh, in a better place. And the examples of Germany, South Korea, Japan, uh, while not perfect, I think are examples of what American engagement can do over the long haul. So that's kind of, those are the underpinnings of, of the book uh, from just kind of a policy and, and thematic standpoint. Um, what I tried to do in chapter by chapter is, you know, rather than talk about these things, I tried to have you experience them through my time on the ground, my time in the White House, my time over in the Pentagon, and then also, of course, my men with me. Um, you know, the introduction starts with, there we are in the black helicopter, we're going after a Taliban commander. Uh, he was responsible for the death of my first KIA and several of our Afghans in that tour. Uh, really a bad character. Well, we, we, we enter the home in a night raid and we accidentally kill his eight-year-old little girl. I had just Skyped with my little girl the night before. 
uh, the emotional toll that that had on us, the impact it had on our counterinsurgency campaign in that area in Ghazni province. But then flashback, there I am with President Bush, Vice President Cheney, and President Karzai talking about the issue of civilian casualties and the effect that that's going to have on or or not have on on uh, Afghan support of the war. And each chapter, you know, kind of goes into that type of back and forth, trying to look at these issues from from all angles. Whether it's Pakistan, and there we are, you know, what do we do with its nuclear arsenal? What do we do with its support of the um, of the insurgency, but yet we're dependent on it for both air and ground supply into the war? But yet there I am get, literally getting rocketed from inside Pakistani uh, uh, military bases along the Afghan border. And, and how, do we, how do we bridge that? Or that the Afghan National Army is not ready and will not be ready um, for at least a generation. Or you know, the total lack of continuity. Uh, when I took command in Khost province, I commanded all of the special forces in southeast Afghanistan. I had about nine months of data to deal with. Um, our lack of continuity in terms of learning from previous lessons, of knowing what we have done. I wrote write in another chapter about uh, a patrol that we conducted in the Tagab Valley outside of Bagram Air Base. I went around to every intelligence officer I could find. This was in 2005. We had been there four years to just talk to me about who had been there before from the United States, who did we talk to, what coalition efforts. We knew that there had been some development projects there, but why? Why in this village and not in that village? I mean, it just didn't exist. All I could find were a few target packages on t targeting some of the key Taliban leaders that we knew transited the area. So, you know, I, I titled that chapter Patrolling to Ambush, because that's essentially what we were doing. I mean, we went out to the area to kind of figure that stuff out ran into ambushes. I was nearly killed. Um, a, an Afghan sergeant that I've become very close to was killed, died in my arms, and I'm still taking care of his family today. That sacrifice turned in, you know, I, I would like to think was worth the information that we gathered, but I'm not confident uh, that that went into some type of repository that others could then learn from. In fact, I know it didn't because I looked for it on my next tour and and it was gone. We just didn't do a great job in that. So I, so I talked to a, a, a number of those issues in each chapter. I also try to address, I think, some fundamental issues that the Army has yet to deal with. Um, you know, one is the layers of bureaucracy that we had to go through to conduct each mission. Uh, in one chapter, I write about the 12 approvals that we had to have to go after one Taliban commander, and I literally had a uh, uh, elder on the phone, a proud old man that we had a great relationship with. His sons were working with us in tears because a Haqqani commander that had, that had uh, threatened his life was next door looking for him, begging us to come get him. And I couldn't get all of the approvals to go uh, about 10 kilometers down the road. And we ended up not only losing that elder, we lost his sons and we lost that village uh, because we couldn't conduct the night raid. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's looking at it, I think, from a different perspective. We've all heard about the negatives of conducting direct action and night raids. Well, there are a lot of positives and there are a lot of negatives to our inaction as well. I also look at just the overall issue of risk aversion that we found. Um, you know, I, one of the issues I don't think we've fully wrapped our minds around is that this is the first and longest war in our history that we fought with an all-volunteer for. Uh, force. Not the first, but certainly the longest. In previous wars, and, and, and we need to look at what that does to our incentive mechanisms. You know, in previous wars coming out of the draft, you were in it to win it. You were, you were pulled out of your lives, whether it was as a lawyer or plumber or what have you, and you were sent to the war and you had every incentive to take every risk possible so that you could come back to your life. Well, now, a tour is a one-year blip on an otherwise promising military career. So the incentive often became, don't mess anything up. Don't get a base overrun. Don't take too many casualties. Don't lose too many kind of what we call sensitive items, night vision, weapons, what have you. So the default reaction in many gray areas became inaction. And, and I say that carefully because I, I never in, 
want or intend to disparage anyone's motivations or service to their country. It's more of a fundamental issue that we haven't really, I think, as a military started, started to deal with. And we've, and we've felt that risk aversion get permeated in a number of ways. Um, one other quick anecdote was I came across that just, you know, kind of a perfect example of this. I came across a base that we were working with on the Pakistani border that was manned by an infantry platoon. 18 soldiers in this platoon. If you think back to, everybody saw the, the movie Lone Survivor, uh, where the four Navy SEALs were, uh, were, were killed and, and, and eventually uh, the one was captured. Four man uh, unit out conducting reconnaissance. Well, after that, kind of a rule, an edict came down that no less than six uh, individual soldiers out on a patrol. Okay, that makes sense. After the base Wanat, the fire base Wanat was overrun in 2008, another edict came down, no less than 14 US soldiers guarding the base. So you can see now, do the math, this platoon had 18 soldiers. They couldn't necessarily leave their base because they wouldn't have enough, but they couldn't go out because they didn't have enough to patrol. And so they ended up having reinforcements flown in every time they even wanted to just go down to the bazaar where the Taliban were openly harassing uh, a girl's school that was down in the village below their base. I mean, think about the signal that that sent military platoons right at the top of the hill, and you have Taliban commanders openly shopping in the bazaar, shutting down shops, and harassing a girl's school. And every time they saw a helicopter come in, they knew that, okay, the Americans are coming now. Guess who got ambushed? So it was kind of those tactical and operational permeations of the risk aversion that really come from some fundamental issues that I, that I try to address. There's a little bit in there um, for lawyers and rules of engagement and uh, law of land warfare. Uh, there were a number of instances that you know, anyone who's had to fight in, a, in this type of, of war have had to deal with. Didn't make it any easier on me. There was a, a certain one where mortar rounds started coming into our position and we saw them walking in one of my snipers finally found uh, who was calling him in. It was about a nine, 10 year old little boy up on a hill with binoculars and a cell phone. No weapon, wasn't armed. But every time he raised the cell phone, we saw another round come in. Um, he's looking at me with the, hey sir, what do we do? Make the call. And I told him to, to put a warning shot down at his feet, which he did, and it splashed rocks on the kid. He dove behind uh, some cover, but he came back out, raised the binoculars, raised the cell phone, and another round came in and wounded some of my Afghans. At this point, I have hostile intent. I'm clear from the Geneva Convention. Um, but I still make the decision to just keep putting warning rounds around the kid until he fled. Who knows if the Taliban had a gun to his family's head, if you know, what the situation was, but that was a call that I made at that time. Was it right or wrong? I think it was right. Would I have felt that way if I was explaining that to the family of one of my men who were killed by one of those mortar rounds? I don't know. Um, so I want to bring those type of experiences to the average, to the American reader as well, uh, aside from these broader policy issues. And then just a few other things that affect today, and, and how do we move forward? today in what I'm convinced is a hundred year effort. I think, we're, yes, this is our nation's longest war, but I think we're about 13 years into a 70, 80, 90, 100 year long effort. Just as we were in the early days in the war, in the effort against communism. I mean, at the end of the day, we're fighting an idea. We're fighting an ideology and that is by far the hardest thing to defeat. And I think we've seen that now. We had the adulation after we killed Osama bin Laden. But the idea of extremism, much like the idea of communism, has survived. And it's going to take a long time to undermine that. Uh, one of the ways, that I, one of the things that I think we're doing right is forming a moderate Arab coalition. This isn't the first time we've done it. Uh, one of our key partners there, the United Arab Emirates, have been with us in Somalia. They've been with us in Bosnia. They've been with us in Afghanistan. Uh, they were with us in the intervention in Libya. And to have partners like that, uh, I was out on the ground with them in several of the chapters of the book. 
uh, in southern Afghanistan. And just to kind of put a face on this, to have an American officer standing next to an, to an Arab officer talking to groups of Afghan villagers, and to have the Arab say, this is not the way. Look at Jakarta. Look at Istanbul. Look at Dubai. There is a better path for you and your children and to still be proper Muslims and followers of Islam. And oh, by the way, he would take it a step further and say, look what the United States did for Germany. Look what it did for Japan. Look what it did for Korea. That kind of a voice uh, immediately undermining the ideology and the, frankly the ignorance that the Taliban was espousing was worth battalions of US soldiers. And then the other piece that I've become very passionate about is girls' education and women's empowerment. We need to take that out of this kind of feel-good humanitarian realm and put it squarely in the national security realm. It is a national security issue. No ideology can suppress 50% of its population and oppress 50% of its population. And I think the more we put brave leaders like Malala, you know, the US, uh, I mean, the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel P Peace Committee doesn't get a lot of things right, in my opinion, but they got that one. They got that one right, and I about fell out of my chair. I was so thrilled. I mean, if you think I'm brave or any of our soldiers are brave, that little girl is brave. And those are the type of women leaders that we need to empower and that we need to really put the full force of, uh, of our government behind in terms of, of emphasizing. Um, and the last thing I'll leave you with, and then I'll turn it over to questions, is the issue of our, of our veterans and the impact that it's having on us, particularly if you start, if you buy into that we're into a multi-decade or multi-generational effort. Um, it truly is having a, a detrimental effect, but that doesn't mean that we're not ready to continue to do it. We don't need sympathy. Uh, what we just need is probably just some support and almost kind of a technical assistance and how do we translate these wonderful skills uh, that we've walked away from this effort into the private sector or into the next life uh, into. But most of all, I'd, I'd ask for your support for the families. You know, it's an all-volunteer force, as I was saying earlier. No one forced us to go do what we're doing. Um, but the families kind of get drug along, and they have to live with the consequences, good or bad. Uh, if we don't come home, or in, and often even when we do come home, it's really the families that uh, are suffering. And we wouldn't have the military that we have today without their without their support. So you know, one of the things I want to make sure everyone's aware of is 100% of the profits uh, from book sales from Warrior Diplomat will go to the Green Beret Foundation and the Matthew Pacino Foundation that focus on the children of our operators that, that uh, weren't able to come home. And I think I'll stop with that, Peter. Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you, that was a really brilliant presentation. Very you know, rich with both, you know, you really get a sense of the big policy questions and also your experience on the ground and how, how they connect. So, you know, when I heard your presentation, I, 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 there's kind of a big question here about the United States, which, because um, I think there's a big tension between the United States, the way it views itself as a country, which is we basically we were cre created trying to escape from an empire, um, and therefore we have a, a natural aversion to anything that we might construe as empire building. Um, and, this, and the fact that a counterinsurgency like Afghanistan you know, if you start talking about nine months or a year, I mean, it, it doesn't, none of that makes any sense. So I guess there's, there's a big question, which is, do we have, <coughs> does the United States have the political will to do the kinds of things that are required to actually not win, because you can't really win, but right. at least manage the situation so that Afghanistan sort of on a, a reasonable glide path? Yeah, so I'd answer that in two parts. The first is, yes, we do have the will. Um, but we need our leadership to begin explaining why this is so important. I'd ask you, when is the last time we've had President Obama mention Afghanistan? Um, you know, and, and, and really begin making the case, he did in the campaign, and I was thrilled to hear it, and make the case of why we need to make this investment, why this is in our national security interests. I mean, a lot of people, you know, if you go back and look if, Pre if President Truman or President Eisenhower had announced that we'll have 30,000 soldiers in South Korea for 70 years,
that probably would have been <laughs> a, a little bit difficult to swallow at yeah, the time, Yeah, it's right? a tough sale. Yeah. Well, uh, let, me, let me ask you another question, because I think I mean, you and I completely agree about Afghanistan and, and the, what the way forward is, but right. it seems to me... But I wanted to get the empire... Okay, Yeah, good. I wanted to get the empire piece, too. The yeah. other piece is, you know, I think we take a lot of things for granted. Um, you know, we the world has enjoyed its longest period of relative stability since World War II in the history of the world. Uh, and a lot of that is because of the overlay, uh, frankly, of American military power, whether it is keeping pirates at bay on Somalia, the Suez Canal, the Moroccan Straits. I mean, the fact that we can go to our gas station and, and buy relatively cheap gas, we can go to McDonald's and get a dollar, you know, and, and order off the dollar menu and enjoy the, the benefits of free trade, uh, you know, they've come from, from our projection of power. And we're seeing now, in my view, we're seeing the consequences of when we've kind of turned our back and looked inward and we're seeing the, I mean, name a success story right now in the foreign policy realm. We're kind of seeing the wheels come off the bus in this kind of moniker of stability that we've overlaid. Uh, and, you know, it, it goes to the fundamental question, does American engagement do more harm than good? I would offer that it has done fantastic good, not to say that we haven't made a number of mistakes along the way. So, you know, I could imagine President, I mean, uh, candidate Hillary Clinton or, or sure. candidate Jeb Bush both putting in their platforms, hey, you know, actually going to zero in, at the end of 2016 is not such a smart idea. Be, so. For Hillary, it would be good politics. It would distinguish her from right. Barack Obama. Right. For the Republicans, it would sort of fit with kind of what their base probably would, would be happy with. So, I, you know, I, I think this, this, and the other thing is, you know, we've negotiated a strategic partnership agreement with the Afghans that goes to 2024. Sure. A great, you know, a lot of effort was put right. into that. So. But at so, the same time, we are announcing the full withdrawal. Right. Yeah. But so I think that the politics are real change around. They clearly, as you mentioned yeah. in your presentation, ISIS right. in Iraq speaks for it's itself. Things. Well, that, that, that talk that I gave in 2012 to a bunch of congressional staffers and made the South Korea analogy and made the case for a multi-decade effort, uh, about a half dozen staffers walked out of the room. Uh, I wasn't, it was not welcome. And when I checked later, uh, almost all of them were Republican. Mm -hmm. So I think this issue of you know, America's role going forward. Can we afford it? Do the American people have the will for it? What are the cost benefits? Is on, I, I, you know, I think it's on both sides of the aisle. Okay. The kind of the Rand Paul. But, but you, know. you know, the debate about the surge in 2009, you know, mm -hmm. there was, uh, I, you know, there was one option that the Pentagon, there was a kind of colonel, um, what is it? Uh, it was like a, a group of colonels in the Pentagon were mm -hmm. trying to think through. One of the issues, mm -hmm. one of the ideas they came up with was go light, but go long. Right. Which I think, Looking back on it, it might have been the smartest because at the end of the day, the Afghans don't really care if it's 21,000 no, or 15,000. Yeah. They just want to basically We're hear We're obsessed that with numbers. We're obsessed by numbers. They want to hear that our grandchildren are going to be standing next to right. their grand and or, that we're with them. Or at least, you know, yeah. but it's going to be the long-term commitment. Fine. Fine. So, but what, the, there is a sort of minimum number below which it doesn't make any sense. Right. I mean, what's your sense what that number is? Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's been a number of studies you know, I'd be, look at what we, what we need to do. Um, you know, we need to keep the air base of Bagram open. That takes several thousand just to, just to right. run the thing. We need to continue uh, our counterterrorism campaign into the Pakistani um, kind of lawless tribal regions in, in the Fatah. Uh, we need to continue mentoring and training the Afghan National Army and, and the police, but the Army uh, as a priority. And right now we have folks at such a high level that if the trees are falling, you know, in, in the forest, so to speak, I don't think we have the visibility to know down at the tactical level within the Afghan army. So we need to, to push those back down. It's a and minimum you, number like 15,000. Yeah, and you add that up, yeah. uh, I think you're at about 15 to 20,000, which right. in up until about 2007 is where we were. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, it, it was interesting, you know, you mentioned the NATO problems and mm -hmm. they, thought, they thought they were getting a peacekeeping mission and mm -hmm. right coincided right when the Taliban came back. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned this term national caveats. Can you uh, just explain what that meant in practice? Yeah, so each, um, there, at that time, there were 42 nations uh, in, the, in the NATO ISAF coalition. And each kind of basically had its own rules of engagement, its own clearance process. Uh, they all reported to the commander of ISAF, but they all also had their own national officer there that reported back to their capital and could kind of override things and it just created between that and then each one being assigned to a specific uh, 
province and not being able to move and shift and reinforce. But a, a kind it, of example, the yeah. Germans wouldn't fly at night, right? That's right. So, I mean, what other examples spring to mind? Well, the, the Dutch uh, could not, could not uh, embark on offensive operations. So, for instance, we just wanted them to pull security for some sniper teams that we had out. Well, that was an offensive operation potentially had to go back to their parliament for permission to borrow one platoon. Well, to command to and control problems, I mean, it was just. But to paraphrase yeah. uh, Donald Rumsfeld, you know, you go to war with the coalition you have. Yeah. And it sounds like, is it better to have a, co I mean, even with all those caveats, it was better to have 42 people, nations in the tent, or was it at more, or did it well, actually it, cause it, it problems? it kind of reached a tipping point. I mean, they called yeah. it flags to post, and, and, and we became almost, you know, obsessed, I would say, with getting more members of the coalition mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, I, I write in the book, at one point, I, I was visiting in my capacity from the Pentagon, and I talked to a group of sergeants. We had 36 U.S. soldiers training 24 NATO mentors to go mentor the Afghans mm -hmm. because they came kind of frankly unprepared. Um, you know, I think we really underestimated uh, the level of atrophy that NATO's military, mm -hmm. you know, experienced after, uh, after the end of the Cold War. Number one. Number two, you know, NATO was really designed to do territorial homeland defense. We are now asking them to do things that we take for granted, but be able to move maintenance and supplies and aerial refueling out to an expeditionary kind of environment. And then three, you know, they were going into probably one of the most complex and difficult environments in the world that their governments hadn't fully signed up to do. I guess, so, I guess there yeah. is an advantage even if, because yeah. there's not only the military dimension, of course, like, you know, uh, you, know the, you get the British, you have DFID, which is a huge aid organization, mm -hmm. you know, the Dutch and all these other countries coming in and they, they have pretty good soft power projection, right? Sure. They do, um, but think, you know, what you have to have out in the field is very close military-civilian integration. Mm. NATO is a military organization, and they often look to the EU to do a lot of the civil policing advising and doing those other things. And so you didn't have that, that integration that you often wanted. You know, look, Peter, I think at the end of the day, yes, there is, there is fantastic benefits to having a political coalition, but we have to be very clear about what they can do on the ground, mm. both from a political will standpoint, but then also from a military capability. So well, how, how would you assess how the coalition is doing uh, right now against ISIS, since we are in a coalition? We are in a coalition, but we have a very, and the other piece is, is, is frankly the proportionality of American leadership and kind of American yeah. heft within it. Right now we have a, a heavily American-led coalition. I talked about, I think there's real benefit to having uh, Arab partners there from a messaging standpoint and from <coughs> just from a broader strategic standpoint. But actually down on the ground, it can get, it, it, it can almost work against you from a coordination. The issue of civilian casualties, um, you know, General McChrystal, when he came in mm. in 2009, kind of really tightened up the rules of engagement. Mm. Um, and um, were, you, were you there then? I was. On, on the ground? I was. Okay, well, so, you know, I, and I think that he was, uh, you know, he really, was it, was it a, a sort of miscommunicated in a way to people on the ground in yeah. a sense? It, it made them overly risk averse or what Yeah, it, no, the, it, it needed to swing. I mean, and when I was there in 2006, oftentimes, you know, we would, we would get engaged by some relatively small or minor insurgent elements and, and you know, call in the Air Force. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was, it, 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 was, uh, it, was, it was too heavy handed. Part of that was just how few forces we had on the ground, how isolated we were. Um, but part of it was we needed a shift in kind of thinking, a shift in mentality from a counterterrorism focus to a counterinsurgency population uh, centric focus. The pendulum, though, went too far. Um, General McChrystal, I think, was right to issue the edicts that he did. The problem was then the next layer of command and the next layer of command, and each layer of command you went down got more and more and more cautious because no one wanted right. McChrystal's finger in their boss's boss's chest. So they, they overinterpreted. It overinterpreted and it really tied our hands so that in situations where we really did need support, and you saw this, you know, from um, the Captain Captain Swanson, the Medal of Honor winner, what have you, where the questioning and hand wringing in the middle of firefights um, was was frankly egregious. And it was a re it was an overreaction. Petraeus tried to mm -hmm. kind of write the pendulum uh, when he came in. Unfortunately, General McChrystal didn't have the opportunity to, 
but it did it did swing too far and it really retarded some of our efforts. I mean, in that part of the world, Peter, you know, people respect strength, uh, and when they see uh, the Taliban and insurgent and the Haqqanis pushing and pushing their limits and constantly attacking, whether it's our bases or what have you, and they see a very tepid response because of this bureaucratic wrangling, it sends a message. Yeah, you sketched out, I think you had four big reasons why things in Afghanistan may, you know, a lot of things have to go right if the things to go right. But, uh, you know, what, what, what is going right? Because I think a lot of Americans who may, you know, uh, listening to this perhaps on C-SPAN, <laughs> yeah. <I> millions, <laughs> of, a drink. millions yeah. of Americans <laughs> watching this yeah. on C-SPAN. Yeah. Um, you know, I think they tend to bracket Iraq and Afghanistan together kind of unfairly. You know, Iraq, the violence is 12 times greater. I mean, the civilian casualty rate is just off the charts right now. Right. Uh, and the fact is, I mean, you spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. I mean, what, what has gone right in Afghanistan, you know, accepting all the things that we know that went wrong? Well, you know, first, look, a lot of things have gone right. I mean, my intent here was let's, let's learn from the lessons, in, you know, in this book from the last 10 years, looking at it from all of the different angles that, that, that I've worked it uh, for the next however many years that we're going to be into it. That doesn't mean we didn't do a lot of things right. I, you know, I mentioned girls' education, which was, which was just... Um, non-existent in the early days of the war and you know my company now works with a number of woman-owned businesses in Afghanistan that are thriving that you just wouldn't have seen even five years ago much less ten uh, the economy broadly speaking and and Ashraf Ghani gets, should get a lot of credit for this for stabilizing the currency uh, for such a for such a war-torn country uh, has has been okay I hope it survives the um, the withdrawal of donor funding. It certainly has the potential to. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about sending a long-term message that we are invested in Afghanistan, it is in our national security interests, and that we're not going to abandon it is for outside investors to come in and to exploit, uh, not exploit, but to uh, work with the Afghans uh, uh, to take advantage of many of the natural resources uh, that they have that the, we're seeing the Chinese and Russians already move into. Um, you know, from a security standpoint, we were starting to really get things right with the Village Stability Operations Program, where we took what I call my tribe of special forces, Army special forces, that Green Berets that specialize in culture, language, and working with indigenous, um, with indigenous forces, to putting them into the village and putting them into tribal areas that had asked for our support, we were seeing, truly starting to see some benefits there. And I think the Afghan National Army is a success story in many ways. I was going ways. to ask you about that. Uh, but we have, to give it, we have to give it time. Well, they're taking a lot of casualties. They are. Suggesting that they're fighting and they're not running like the Iraq Army just did mm -hmm. earlier this year. Um, and I mean, I think that the, uh, if you ask people around Washington a year ago, how would the Afghan National Army do? Most people would say it's going to be a complete catastrophe. That seems to be basically wrong. Well, but, but in fairness to the Iraqi army, uh, we were, you know, folks who are following it closely were looking at the, the violence and the casualties and the fighting that's been going on for the last two and a half, three years. I mean, this isn't a brand new problem in the last six months. They did finally collapse. I'm worried, you know, we just saw a base get overrun in Helmand province, mm -hmm. a fairly large base. Where was it? Down in, uh, it was Sangin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sangin. Yeah. Um, one of the bases down there, Fab Robinson, is named after one of my soldiers mm. uh, that, that was killed there and, and, um, and, and, and is now being threatened by a Taliban overrun. So I worry that we're beginning to see those initial um, kind of indicators that we saw two years ago with the Iraqi army. Well, I'm not so sanguine. <laughs> not so yeah. sanguine. Yeah. <laughs> um, one final question before sure. opening the audience. Uh, you know, Helmand was the was a, a huge amount of a lot of Americans died there. A lot of Brits died there. Did that make any sense? I mean, uh, the whole point of counterinsurgency is to protect the population. Right. Only one percent of the population was living in Helmand. Was wh why did we do that? Yeah, I mean, Helmand Helmand made sense uh, from the perspective that it is the Helmand River is a it's it's a virtual highway. Uh, into Orozgan and into Hang uh, Kandahar. Should we have focused on Kandahar City first? Yeah, absolutely. I think our sequencing was off, and that happened for political reasons of the having to do with the Brits and then with and then the, the Marine Marines. Corps right. wanting to have their own was space. Was it like trying to defeat Nazi Germany by attacking Austria first? Yeah, fair enough. That's a great. Okay, yeah, that's a great. <laughs> great Let's analogy. throw it open to questions. Yeah. 
And if you have a question, can you wait for the mic and identify yourself and raise your hand? This gentleman. Hi, uh, I'm Tawab Malikzad. I'm with the Voice of America Afghan Services. Uh, I have uh, two questions, one, par one question with two parts. The first one is about uh, Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan time and again has shown that they're not interested in, in having a clear foreign policy towards Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The civilian government says one thing, the military does another thing, and the civilian military, uh, government that has, not, has no power over the military. What can United States, it's kind of a broad question, but what should be United States' strategy towards the military, not the civilian government, but towards the military? Because this, at the beginning of this year, United States sent uh, about $1.6 $1 billion to, 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 to Pakistan, and over half of that goes to the same military that's funding Haqqani, that's funding the other uh, uh, Afghan Taliban across the border. What can the United States can do to, to prevent the, the, the military to stop supporting? And the second question is about NATO's new, mi mi uh, new mission that starts in a month, the Resolute Support, I guess that's the name. The main purpose of that mission is to train Afghans. Mm -hmm. Would you consider this new method for a lack of a better word, a failed strategy, because training Afghans is not gonna uh, not gonna defeat the enemy. It's just gonna create more s more soldiers for the enemy to kill. Because for Afghans, they are there to make money to bring food home, but for Taliban, they are there to they are willing to die. I know a lot of Afghans, uh, Afghan families who have lost children, and when you ask them that that what do you think, the first thing that they say about their their child is they say that. Oh, that was the only bread maker at, at home. Right. So they're in the army to make right. money, not right. to fight. And it's pretty clear. No, I'm still supporting some of the families of the Afghan soldiers. Oh, thank that you were, so much. I appreciate they, that. Yeah. You know, not only do you lose a husband and a father, you lose your only breadwinner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what would you suggest for, for this like, new NATO mission in Afghanistan? That How should they approach this training to, that actually benefits the Afghan army? Sure. Well, that's two easy questions. Mm. <laughs> So first on, uh, yeah, first on Pakistan, which I think we could have a whole other forum on. Um, you know, from one perspective, yes, I hear you. Um, you know, Pakistan cares about its own interests, as any country does. And you know, from the, again, I know I sound like a bit of a broken record, we saw a shift uh, both out on the ground and then back here diplomatically with Pakistan about 2005, 2006, when we, you know, when we did the full shift over to NATO. And I think it became very clear to them, at least in, in kind of off-the-record discussions, that this was the beginning, even that early, of the eventual U.S. withdrawal. That's not making an excuse, um, but that's just looking at it from Pakistan's uh, viewpoint, and that they're going to be left you know, holding this mess, so to speak, uh, as they viewed Afghanistan, and they're going to work through their proxies. And we all know that working through surrogates and working through proxies is... Um, you know, a key part of Pakistan foreign policy. At least, at least I think that's accepted now. What do we do about it? One, I do think we need to relook the issue of, um, of our monetary support to the Pakistani military. But we have to be very careful. Uh, I've sat in many, many of these debates and are we truly prepared to, one, either let Pakistan become destabilized, given its arsenal, or two, make an enemy of Pakistan that we're, I mean, how far down that path did we really go? And I, every time we did from a policy standpoint, it got so scary in many ways that we pulled back and just continued trying to change their behavior. So in my view, their nuclear arsenal is, is the key. And we have to be very careful about how far we let Pakistan uh, get destabilized. That said, as we're providing funds, are we providing funds to buy more tanks? to face India, or are we providing funds to help them fight the counterinsurgency, one, and two, as we shift there, if we try to work with the Pakistanis to shift towards focusing on this extremist problem that's now threatening Pakistan as well, we have to, I think we have to really think about whether we're willing to accept the Pakistanis being more reliant on their nuclear arsenal now vis-a-vis -vis India. So I mean, it's a broader, it's, it's such a broader regional problem, but I think we have, you know, the United States needs to think about what its priorities are. And on the train and advise real fast, you know, I agree with you. I agree with where I think you're going. You know, it's kind of like, right, doing training only is kind of like telling the coaches of a football team, you can only go with your team to practice. 
Once they go out for the big game, though, you, you got to have to wave goodbye at the gate. We need to do the advising, which means going out with them uh, and, and conducting operations to also facilitate the enablers, uh, the medevac, the air support, all of the other things that's going to take a long time for the Afghan army to, to, to be able to develop. Just, just to follow up on Pakistan, sure. I mean, you know, we had a, uh, it was an off-the-record discussion so, uh, with General Sharif, the, the new head of the, relatively new head of the Pakistani military, and he was sitting in that chair. And, you know, he had come to Washington, and he went down to Tampa to St. Com. And, you know, if you look at where relations, um, U.S.-Pakistan relations were in 2011, they've, right. they've kind of come a long way. There was, mm -hmm. there was the Raymond Davis affair. Um, there the was border incidents. The border yeah. incidents. There yeah. was the bin Laden killing. I mean, but things mm -hmm. have sort of, things seem to be a lot more normalized. And a big factor here is the Pakistani military operation in North Waziristan, which is something that the United States has been wanting the Pakistanis to do for a long time. Mm -hmm. So what's your assessment of how that operation has gone? Um, you know, it, the operation, first the operation was advertised months in advance, and then there's a lot of speculation about why that was, was advertised. You know, and, and talking to folks out on the ground, they kind of saw a shift of the Haqqani network out of the area of operations up into the northern uh, parts of the Fatah. So there are many folks who believe, uh, and I'm not sure where I am on it, that that was, frankly, for show and, and to both I, I think it's internally more and... I, I think it's a little more complicated than yeah. that, because this, this was an actually a very rare example of where yeah. the military actually wanted to do the operation mm. and was being constrained. The civilian, the civilian government was saying, hey, wait a minute, we need to extend these negotiations with the Taliban. And clearly they right, right. were never going to go anywhere, and they didn't. Right. But you know, if you're a civilian leader, you do want to sort of show, hey, we're not, you know, we did everything we could before we... Yeah, no, I think, I, I think that in fairness, there is a growing chorus within, within Pakistan of we can't, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. Yeah. And we can't control this thing anymore, and we truly have to take it on. And that is encouraging. I think there has been uh, a that is, change. That is encouraging. I don't know that I'm willing to go that far to say that the military writ large and its most senior leaders have kind of changed their calculus on the usefulness that you know, of, of using proxies. Um, but I do think there is a growing chorus, particularly among some of its junior officers that have been out there on fighting the ground, the fighting them. Uh, as, as, but again, you know, what are, what's the constant theme here is time. It's, you know, as those, that generation, you know, continues to progress, it's And you know, Ghani, uh, the, the new president, Ghani, went to Pakistan. I mean, as, as uh, General Sharif, the Pakistani chief of the chief of army staff, mm -hmm. went to Afghanistan. I mean, it seems to be like, you know, Karzai was publicly enormously critical of two countries, the United States and Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah. You are not hearing Opt that. Often for <laughs> <laughs> so what but, he viewed as the you know, which reasons. in a kind of yeah. pretty unhelpful way yeah. for all concerned, right? right? So I think, you know, Ashraf Ghani, yes, there is this sort of issue about the, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Abdullah and he not agreeing on every cabinet position. But, I mean, they, they're both technocrats. They're both pretty savvy people. And they both have, you know, the, if it, if it doesn't work between them, this whole thing goes south, right? Right, right. and they realize that. And I yeah. think we have two. I think we have two very reasonable, uh, well-educated, you know, decent men in those positions. But it's it's almost like having you know Mitt Romney and Barack Obama in the same White House. I mean, right. Still, and I'm not worried about them so much. I'm worried about kind of the secondary yeah. and tertiary layers of of warlords and strongmen behind them that are going to lose patience at some point and are already beginning to, to hedge and, and do things that are unhelpful. So I don't think time's on our side, but I am yeah. still trying to be optimistic. And what about these, you know, we've seen a series of attacks in Kabul. Yesterday, the U.S. State Department um, released a very, very explicit advisory saying, yeah. you know, U.S. personnel shouldn't like, go anywhere in Kabul. I mean, uh, you know, is this, is this the Taliban trying to show the flag? Because, and, but they're you know, really hitting mostly soft targets, essentially, or right. is this something bigger, or is this... Oh, I think you're seeing, I mean, you know, from Jalalabad to Kunar to Helmand uh, and, and in the east and up into Kabul, you're starting to see a, a pretty concerted push. Um, I'm, I am r praying that we can get uh, a new set of ministers and really get a, a, a responsible government in place before the spring and before what I expect will be a pretty hefty now the, uh, New York Times, the New York Times did say the Obama administration seems to have changed the rules of engagement for 2015 in terms yep. of like actually letting American advisors get involved in combat. Well, it's letting, in fair, it's letting, uh, yeah, it's letting us provide air support uh, okay. again down on the ground, which had been essentially turned off by both 
President Karzai and the administration. So that's turned back on right. from, from both Ghani and the administration, which is a positive. But in order to be able to really use that, which is what we're seeing in Iraq right now, you know, it's, we're running a lot of sorties. We're not dropping a lot of bombs or doing a lot of things on the ground because you need those folks tactically out with. And tell, t so tell me, tell us what is, yeah, sure. what's really happening on the ground, because it's, it's not very clear to, in terms of what the, we, so we're drawing down, I mean, you mentioned the visual, village stability operations, mm -hmm. which are all sort of special forces in sure. the local community. Which are pulled back. They're all, being, they're all gone? Or? They're all pulled back. So we pulled those folks back. They do what's kind of, uh, what's known as a kind of over, village overwatch, where they go out and visit these local, they're called Afghan local police, but many of them were recruited from tribal militia. In my view, that's the worst of both worlds. Either you don't have that type of program with all of the um, inherent risks that come with that, or you're out there with them so you know exactly what's going on mm. and who, who's wearing what jersey. But to create you know, this, kind of, this kind of force and not have the oversight um, that we bring, I think is really dangerous. So that's, that's one. And two, all of our advisors have been pulled up to the core level well, anybody here who's served in the military knows that a core commander doesn't always know what's going on down at the platoon and, and, and that's true level. for conventional and SF or what is it that's that's across the board conventional we still have special forces teams with their commandos right which are doing which are able to go out and do offensive operations with the Afghans in the lead and, and us accompanying let's throw it open to another yeah. question sure this gentleman here in the front Hi, thank you for your service and for your book. Thank you. Uh, Burton Gerber, Georgetown University. Um, the media and the American government and observers and everyone refer counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, often without making distinctions mm -hmm. about what they are. Mm -hmm. And dealing with a counter, uh, dealing with an insurgency requires different kinds of skills and deployments sure. and so forth than terrorism. Yet our government, for instance, still has counterterrorism centers, and I don't know of any counterinsurgency center. Uh, Iraq now, uh, we're, we're confronting the Islamic State. The president was clear when he made a statement that we will degrade and destroy ISIS. Those were the very words he used. Mm -hmm. uh, and that clearly uh, would indicate a recognition that ISIS is an insurgency, not a terrorist organization, although it uses terrorist tactics clearly. What kind of confidence do you have that the president and the US government is committed to the long-term effects of long-term requirements of confronting an insurgency like IS. Certainly it has garnered some coalition, mm -hmm. but it hasn't deployed the kind of forces like, for instance, the, the, um, air, um, the airstrike personnel. Do you think that it's reali realistic what the president has said about degrade and destroy? Wow. Um. You know, I'll go back to some of my analogies with, with the Cold War, with our efforts against communism. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, at the end of the day, over the course of history, people who are disenfranchised, who feel like they don't have opportunity or disconnected from their governments, that don't see a better path for their, for their children, have, have gravitated towards some type of movement whether it was socialism, communism, or now extremism, that they feel gives them a mechanism to, to address those grievances. At the same time, I think you have people who use and abuse those movements. To, you know, it's all about power and, and main either maintaining power or seeking power. So, I mean, taking a very macro view, I think the entire extremist, you know, Islamic extremist movement is an insurgency to some degree against either the Gulf monarchies or what they see, you know, Western liberal societies, or you know, the the kind of abusive government. If you want to really drill down, that's you know, um, that they they have grievances against. So yes, 
to answer your question, I think, we need to take a broader, very broad view of how do we undermine uh, this ideology just as we undermine. I mean, you know, people ask me, what does victory look like? And I would tell you, I think victory looks like when ISIS, Al Qaeda, you know, um, Hezbollah, what have you, can't recruit anymore. And their ideology has no draw. I mean, think back to the 80s, GSG-9, Red Brigades, think, you know, those, those communist groups, uh, Shining Path down in Peru, were very powerful, could recruit, and were furthering, furthering their agenda, and now they're, now they're a joke. Why? You know, what happened to the draw of that ideology? And I think we have to get uh, this current one to the same place. And I take your point, terrorism is just a tactic. It's well, just a mechanism. To follow up on that, yeah, Mike, sure. I mean, so communism as an ideology actually was a, didn't last very long. It was seven decades, basically. Mm -hmm. And it expired really, big, I mean, when the Soviet Union expired, I mean, right. I'm sure there's still communist professors somewhere at some French university, but yeah. Yeah, it's a very minority kind sure. of position. So it was very tied to the actual experience of the Soviet Union and, and the fact that it just didn't deliver. And ultimately, yeah. I think that was yeah. the, the biggest sort of variable. So the, the ideology that sort of fuels ISIS is in a sense older and it also claims uh, that it, it is a sort of a God uh, sort sure. of centric ideology. I think, I think those sort of ideologies are, are often harder to kill or even to manage or, or you right. know, hope that they just so, I mean, sketch out a future, well, you said, I mean, in your earlier remarks that this could go on for 100 years. So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and other people have talked about a 30 years war and, you know, I mean, this is something that could go on for a while, but how would it, what would the end, uh, you've explained what the end looks like, but how do we get there? Because, yes, I think you're the gentleman's, you know, in a sense, critiquing sort of where the Obama administration is, but you're also endorsing the fact that there is this Arab element of the coalition, which is obviously very important. Sure, a moderate Arab right. element. Right. So, what else could can we do, and how how do we hasten this? And and of course, the American government has a sort of kiss of death problem in a lot of this, because you know we can't talk about Islam in any meaningful way, and we're not necessarily the best messenger. So, what is so you're advising the president in um, you know February 2017? What would you say to him or her? So. You know, there's, th there needs to be a few components, and, and some of it is, is looking at ourselves internally. I mean, we're not organized as a government to really conduct this type of, of effort. And, and to put it, it's oversimplistic, but our, our skills that we need, whether they're border patrol agents or police advisors or what have you, are in our civilian agencies or our ability to operate in an unstable space is in the military. So you had this kind of you know, at least over the last 15, you know, 14, 15 years, this constant back and forth of, you know, I've got platoon leaders from the 82nd Airborne trying to figure out how to be town mayors. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you've got, uh, you know, we're reaching out. We need, we need to help either Iraq or Afghanistan control its borders. Well, you know, last time I checked, the Border <laughs> Patrol is an expeditionary. <laughs> so, so it w first of all, we need, and we've, we've made attempts at doing that, whether it's, <laughs> The PRT, or whether it's um, you know whether it's the uh, the office in the State Department, the Civilian Response Corps, but we need to look at a kind of a broader uh, effort that you know that, that that we essentially take a stability approach to mm -hmm. many of these areas, and then we could talk about how do we prioritize. Um, one, two is you know countries like the UAE, countries like Turkey, although not under the Erdogan government uh, really need to be key partners in this. And I, and I try to give that anecdote in the book of I can't, I mean, I just can't overstate uh, how powerful that message is coming from, you know, coming from moderate Arab elements that can say and do things towards the ideology, whether, you know, sitting down with a, gro a group of mullahs and, and really explaining to them of kind of how they're getting it wrong that, that we just can't do. Um, so there needs to be an Arab coalition element, there needs to be a whole of government element and a reorganization, kind of almost a, uh, a, a jointness across our interagency for us to be able to address it. And then I think there's a political dimension that you, that you hit on in terms of wrapping the American people's minds around the fact that this is, you know, this is going to be a long-term effort and it's in our national interest to begin doing it, much like we had in the 50s and 60s. 
I, I get it. There are many imperfect uh, elements of that analogy with mm. the Cold War and communism, but I think there's a lot of commonality, too, that people can say, yeah, okay, that took us 70 years to defeat this effort. And, and while we don't have a Soviet Union, you know, that, that is kind of the big enemy, you know, this is, these are non-state actors, but we do have, I mean, we've got Wahhabism, I mean, we have certain you know, certain states that I think have been more responsible than, than others. We have to be careful about yeah. Wahhabism because I think the, the kind of analogy, you know, anybody who bombs an abortion clinic in, in this country is a Christian fundamentalist almost without exception. Yeah. Very few Christian fundamentalists bomb abortion clinics. So like there are, a lot, there are millions of Wahhabis. In sure, that's right. So that's we right. just have to be very careful about yeah, you're how right. we identify yeah, you're right. uh, because that doesn't make you a violent Salafist. No, it doesn't. Status, no, yeah. it doesn't. No, yeah. it makes you a conservative within right. your religion of choice. Ladies, gentlemen, other question? This gentleman here. Uh, Mike, Catalan. Mike Catalano with Veteran Crowd. I served a very short time as a civilian advisor um, during 2010-2011 winter. Um, on the economic uh, development side, on the, uh, I'd like to hear your comments on the shift from a bottom down, a top down approach mm -hmm. to economic development where we spent billions and I had to sit next to consultants doing the postmortem on the Capital Bank collapse where our taxpayer assets went to, to buy properties and um, uh, Western institutions, uh, that is banks, uh, probably won't exist in Afghanistan in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, U.S. Treasury's position is, you know, we, we need them to adhere to Basel II or Basel III. That's never going to happen. So where is the bright spot on the horizon for a bottoms-up economic development, and how are, how are women part part of that change, in your view, in terms of women-owned businesses and enterprises? Sure. sure. Um, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity in the last few years through my business to really work with the Afghan private sector. I've never, um, I've never come across a more entrepreneurial uh, society, uh, you know, and I've, and I've worked and lived all over the world. Um, Afghans truly will kind of bootstrap and, and, and make their own future for themselves if just given a little, given a little help. Um, so I think part of it's through both women and men, through the private sector, through bringing in private investment. There's a lot of folks in the Middle East in particular that are looking to deploy uh, investment dollars, but they need, I mean, they need the basic things. You know, what does every investor want? They want predictability and they want some level of stability. Uh, and, and frankly, in a lot of these conferences, would come to me or, you know, I, I see Charlie back there from the Commerce Department say, what's the United States going to do? You know, this was, you know, are we going to turn out the lights in 2014? This was a few mm -hmm. years ago when just those constant questions, so folks held on to their dollars. So to answer, your, to answer your question more succinctly, through the Afghan private sector, there's enormous, there's enormous opportunity. Um, the top down, bottom up, I, you know, we've struggled with that. Um, Ashraf was, you know, one of the biggest proponents of putting those funds through Afghan ministries under the kind of the, the guise of we'll, we'll never develop capacity if you're always going around us. At the same time, we have to be responsible stewards of taxpayer and do donor dollars, and, and we want it to get to where it's going to make the most impact as fast as possible. So we had the, the PRT mechanism. To, to do that. I think there needs to be a balance of both, um, like, like, you know, pretty much like in anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ashraf Ghani and Claire Lockhart came, mm -hmm. you know, basically, they, they had something called the National Solidarity Program, which right. gives very small uh, grants yep. on a local basis. Uh, that seems to be sort of, an, it, it, uh, it hasn't cost a great deal of money compared to what we put in. Yep. That, that's basically been a success? You know, it was a success from, in, and, and again, I've worked from, from Nimra's, you know, all the way up uh, into Nangahari, success in areas that were relatively stable. Hmm. Uh, you know, we broke up, my uh, special forces unit broke up a number of rings that were extorting the National Solidarity hmm. Program in Paktia and Host in 2009-2010. Hmm. Everyone knew, so this is a program that basically elects tribal, um, or that elects you know, local councils that are authorized to receive the funds and then basically you know, helps them make local decisions on where the aid dollars are going rather than folks doing it from Kabul or even worse, Westerners trying to make those decisions. 
But what happened was the insurgents would literally have a gun to their head mm. and say, go withdraw the money and, and give it to us or else. So I, I, I know a lot of my remarks were very security focused, but whether it's national, you know, whether it's NSP or the private sector or better governance, you have to have, a, you know, I mean, security is just the oxygen that all of those efforts. The, the gentleman asked about the, about the Kabul sure. bank, which was like, you know, basically a $1 billion robbery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, the Ghani uh, administration is now handing down some pretty yeah. tr stiff pres prison sentences. I mean, this, this is a... Yeah, no, I think it's absolutely the right move. Yeah. Because um, I mean, without that, that we, no one's going to... I worked counter narcotics policy from in the Defense Department for years and, and spent years of my life uh, frankly, undermining folks in the State Department that wanted to make our counter-narcotics policy eradication and aerial eradication. We're actually spraying crops of the very people we were trying to win over. I had and do push for more of an interdiction strategy, and we pushed President Karzai and others. I mean, just, just arrest a handful of these most notorious guys. It, mm. It, it sends the right signal to your people. It sends the right signal to them in these kind of drug and criminal networks. And, and I think it really, you know, will tamp down some of this most egregious behavior. So I, I applaud the move. This gentleman here. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Chris Day. I'm from Third Group. And uh, I have a bit of experience in Iraq and in Afghanistan and from every deployment I've seen the thing that you said that struck me most was that risk aversion is probably the military's I think biggest problem. Um, I was wondering if from your experience at senior levels of uh, Department of Defense are people aware of this and, and what it means for people at you know the company level and below? Yeah so you'll read a, a chapter in there when uh, uh, at that time Assistant Secretary uh, Mike Vickers now Under Secretary for Intelligence Mike Vickers came out and visited some of our teams and I walked him through the problems that were going on and you should have seen the the, the death stares I was getting from the colonels mm. that had come with them but I having been on his end of things as his advisor at one point I knew what he was coming out he wanted to kind of get some ground truth and dug on it I was going to give it to him um, and let him and really make him aware of these layers uh, that kind of accumulate and, and as I was saying each one is put in place for good reason it makes sense in isolation, but it was accumulation over time that, um, that caused the problems. And I was in the Pentagon when President Karzai first complained about night raids to Secretary Rumsfeld. And the commander at the time, General Eikenberry, you know, then said every time we go after a Taliban commander at night, it has to come to a three-star level for approval. You, <laughs> you can imagine what that did. So. The answer is, is mixed. Sometimes they're aware, sometimes it's done on purpose. Um, you know, in that case, he wanted to come to his level to, to tamp down the numbers that were going on. And sometimes they're, you know, sometimes they're just not aware. Um, and there's a real reluctance for civilian policymakers who are going out to the field to begin, you know, that, have that 7,000 mile screwdriver and begin questioning and, and, and changing how we conduct things, you know, how we conduct ourselves operationally. It's a tough, tough problem. Mike, that raises a really yeah. interesting, so, you know, the Bin Laden raid was yeah. watched in real time by the commander in chief and right. uh, many of his, and it's really the first time in history that a tactical operation was being seen in real time by the commander in chief. By the commander in chief, yes, but not back here in. But, yeah. so, but, but obviously the, the technology exists for yeah. like, you know, for the president or anybody in his cabinet to be theoretically micromanaging what you, an op, you know, an operation you do in the field in Uruzgan. Right. right. So how does that change things? Yeah, it's changed a lot of things. I mean, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about drones. I think we're having one in, in a few weeks and, yeah. and the effect that that's had on kind of modern warfare. Um, you know, it's a mix between risk avert to answer your question a little bit further the risk aversion that I think has seeped into what I call a careerist force rather than you know, an all-volunteer force because now we have folks that are focused on this is one spot in their career. And then between technology that literally allows things to be managed um, from afar. And I've, I've had it done to me and, and, and I'm sure you, you have as well. Uh, it, it plays a huge role. It's one of the reasons I take umbrance, though, to flip that around, this notion that we often hear in the media that, you know, our, 
our special forces guys are kind of some cowboys that are out there just kicking in doors willy-nilly or we're dropping you know um, hellfire missiles from predator drones you know at kind of the flip of a switch there is an elaborate process with lawyers at every <laughs> level uh, standing right at the commander's shoulder with a series of um, kind of criteria of whether we can take that shot or whether we can go on that raid to the point that I argue in the book to our detriment. It, uh, our hands are too tied. The pendulum has swung too far. Uh, and it really, you know, a, as I said, our inaction often had greater consequences than our action did. Does that answer your? Yeah, yeah sure. This gentleman here. Hi, I'm Hale Laughlin. I have a little bit of time in Afghanistan, and uh, I've been part of the uh, sort of the guerrilla insurgency along with your community and a few others uh, for uh, a few decades now that has tried to fight the coin battle inside the policy realms mm -hmm. in, in the beltway here mm -hmm. and in the combatant commands. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you offer as advice? How do we fix the policy? When we woke up in this alternative universe this morning where we've got representatives from the Joint Staff, DOD, advertising that the Afghan National Security uh, Forces and police are going to be able to take care of this problem. Yeah. At the same time, we're sitting here listening to you introducing your book yeah. and all the things we know about the reality. We have a severe policy disconnect. So what would you offer for advice and how to fix that? And don't just say vote for the right people. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I mean, you know, the, the signal and direction and the, you know, it's in some ways, the way it should work. I mean, the strategic direction by the, the civilian elected commander in chief is, you know, the military should, in a large degree, uh, in a civilian in a civilian run military, be in line with that. Um, but there are some fundamental issues within, particularly the army itself, that are also at play, regardless of who gets elected in two, four, um, eight years from now. And one is that the is that the army in particular still wants to fight big wars. And this is getting into a long conversation with the military industrial complex that requires big equipment and big shiny objects that employ a lot of people and factories spread across all 49. I mean, counterinsurgency doesn't have a constituency. It doesn't require a lot of stuff. Special forces is what percentage of the uh, US military? Uh, oh, I want to say about, of, of the army, at least army special forces, it's in the, it's like three to four percent. My, my impression right. overall, it's like one and a half percent. Yeah, yeah. It's very, it's, it, it's very yeah, inexpensive. It's tiny, and right. it doesn't have a lot of bright, That's shiny right. objects right. attached to it. Um, so is the army, um, you know, I mean, is there obviously there's some very bright people like General McMaster and, mm -hmm. you know, trying to like, you know, kind of retain the lessons learned. Do you think, the Army is doing an okay job. Also, if you look at the Army strate the strategic vision that it just uh, released this fall, I think that was a, uh, an important step in the right direction. The holy grail for moving the massive tanker that is the U.S. Army is doctrine. Yeah. And it starts, uh, and H.R. McMaster is now the deputy at the Army's Doctrine Command, uh, TRADOC, which I think, w which I applauded. Um, so, so there's some, I think, some of the right people it's been a decade-long effort, if not longer, to get some of the right people in place. And again, it's that, you know, like we were just talking about with Pakistan, some of that younger generation that I hope stays in the military to try to, to affect some change rising up. And part of it is the world situation isn't changing. And mm -hmm. you know, we can, the Army, this administration mm -hmm. can wish the world to look differently and want to shift where it wants to shift, but the enemy gets a vote, and they're certainly voting right now. And it's going to require highly trained, highly skilled, culturally attuned, um, you know, special operators that are willing and capable and able to live amongst, um, you know, local national populations and, and take a buy with and, a, and through approach. You know, one of the disconnects right, I think is going on right now with, with Iraq is boots on the ground or no boots on the ground. And, and I think to a lot of folks, boots on the ground means another invasion and divisions rolling through. We're talking about just taking the trainers, I think many of us are talking about, and letting them advise, letting them do what they're, what they're trained. By the way, the 3,000 American soldiers who are in Iraq right now, do they yeah. wear boots? They do. They're on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So and if you ask their families, they're, right. they're, in, the, they're in a war zone. And how many were there a year ago? Mm, about, what, 300? 300. 300. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, is this, is this like 1963 with Kennedy? Well, at least in 1963, they were able to go out with a, 
with the Viet South Vietnamese Army and help them do. I mean, again, I mean, the, the, the analogy that I've received the most response to is the football coach that, that mm. can't leave practice, right? right? Can't go to the game. That's a great analogy. You know, and, and we have to be able to go to the game. Well, on that note, uh, let's give uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Waltz a big round of Thanks. applause. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it.